welcome back to the channel this is trendy storm and you are watching 10th part of what if naruto mastered ancient shinobi way if you enjoyed this video please like share and subscribe to the channel now wasting no more time let's start the story the air above arashigakir no sato shifted and swirled into a vortex and a large brown eagle flew out of it the presence of this bird indicated the return of hanada as she was the only one capable of summoning such a creature this is where we'll get off Naruto said as he leapt from the bird, Tsubaki following close behind. Her training as a Reizoku clan ninja was evident because she showed no fear of jumping from that height, instead placing her trust in Naruto's hands. This was a good thing because Naruto could control the wind and thus safely levitate him and Tsubaki to the ground beneath, right in front of the tower. When he arrived, he was greeted by Naruto's secretary. Do you believe your mission was successful? As the group entered the tower and made their way to Naruto's office, the secretary inquired. Yes, it went perfectly, Naruto said as his secretary handed him a piece of paper. It's a mission request from Genji Ojisama, the secretary explained, he's not doing well and fears that his time is running out. I see, Naruto said, his face sad. The request simply states that he wants to see me, so I will go see him right away. As you wish, Kanshisha sama, she says, but. But he was gone before she could say anything, leaving her to think to herself, there are missions to assign. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. It would be an understatement to say she was surprised to see a shadow clone. She was familiar with all of Naruto's jokes and nuances, and dealing with ninja was nothing new to her, but the way he did things like this was still beyond her, and she had enough experience with ninja to know that it was not something common. He simply appeared and disappeared, and if she wasn't careful, he could easily slip away from her using a cage bunchener, if he was feeling particularly mischievous. Didn't Hanada-sama forbid you from using cage bunshin to help you with your work? Naruto simply gave her an award-winning smile, put on the charm, and leaned in close. Please, he begged Machiko-chan. That was it, the pressure was on, and all he had to do now was wait for her to give in. I'm sorry, Naruto-sama, but this level of seduction cannot work on me, she lied, my neighbors are the Kitsumara clan, but most of all, I am afraid of what Hanada-sama would do to me if I allowed myself to be swayed. With that, she squeezed her eyes shut and punched and dispelled Naruto's shadow clone desperately. She opened her eyes and saw nothing. She sighed in relief and went to Naruto's office to place the remaining paperwork on his desk. It was unusual for the leader of a ninja village to have a civilian as his secretary, but that did not make her helpless. Every day, she was exposed to various high-level ninja and their peculiarities. She may not be able to hide her emotions like them or even read their emotions, but because she was a civilian, and a trustworthy and tight-lipped one at that, she would be easily overlooked if anything happened, allowing some of the village's secrets to escape. I apologize, Uzumaki-sama, Machiko said as she approached his door, flashbacks of a sweetly smiling Hanada with the presence of an Oni behind her flashing through her mind, but that woman is a Haniya. When she opened the door, she was met by Naruto's shadow clone, who was furiously scribbling and stamping away at the paperwork on the desk. When he saw her, he paused, looked up, and smiled sheepishly at her. She returned her gaze down the corridor where she thought she had expelled him, only to find a shoe on the ground. Kawarimi? She inquired to herself. Will I tell if you don't tell? How are you doing, Genji Oji-sama? Genji, the old man was the oldest man in the village, one of the village elders, and rumor had it, he came from the original whirlpool, but that could just be rumor. What are you doing here, Kanshisha-sama? Jubei inquired from the bad side of the old man. I came to pay my last respects to a great elder, Naruto explained, and I assume you came to pay your respects to one of your masters? Jubei gave a nod. You flatter me, Naruto-sama, he said before coughing, but I have a request for you. If it is within my power, it will be done, Naruto declared. Thank you, he coughed again, but before I do that, 
I need to tell you something, something you probably don't know about your clan. Have you heard of the Uzumaki clan? Of course, they were to the Edi village as the Senju were to Konoha growing up in the old Whirlpool country. That implies that this location is not. That's right, this isn't the original Whirlpool, he said, taking a few labored breaths. Edi village had very strong ties to the leaf, to the point where all their ninja bore the Uzumaki clan's crest. That explains a lot, Naruto thought to himself after realizing he had interrupted himself. I apologize. Please continue. The Shodai even took an Uzumaki as his bride, but it was destroyed due to war and the fear of Eddie Village's sealing capabilities. What happened to the village people, my clan? Naruto inquired. But rumor has it that she died some time ago and we feared that she was the last one, that is, until you came along, more coughing racked his body, but with so few of us, we were lucky that we survived the way we did until you came. And the last I ever heard of any Uzumaki was a woman who married the Yandaimi Hokage so we never bothered to disturb her happiness, Naruto-sama, you were the last of your clan, and I am honored to have known you, no matter how brief. Naruto was barely able to hold back the tears at the end of this story, but he did. My time is short, so I will tell you my request, he struggled to hold on for a moment longer, spread my ashes over the soil of my birth, that way I can bring back the last of the Uzumaki, the son of Whirlpool, home. With that, his eyes slowly closed, and a calm sigh escaped his mouth. It will be completed. Naruto then pulled the sheet over his head and exited the room. Later that evening, Naruto was in the hospital, holding Hanada tenderly outside the emergency room, her expression exhausted but pleased. How are they? He inquired as he held her in his arms. Well, Sasuke is in surprisingly good shape, only exhaustion and a few broken bones and lacerations, but he will awaken in a day or two, so I suggest transporting him tomorrow or as soon as possible in order for your plan to work," Hanada said, Itachi, on the other hand, is a little worse, the seal you placed on him did its work, but when we operated on him, we noticed that he had absolutely no chakra. So, what can we do to help him? Naruto inquired, his voice concerned. The seal on his body stopped him from dying, but it also stopped his body as if it were on ice, so we poured enough chakra into him that when you removed the seal, he would still be suffering from mild exhaustion, but he would recover quickly within two weeks, Hanada finished, perking up as if she remembered something, and speaking of seals, look at these. She held two photographs of Sasuke's neck region, one on each side. What do you mean, I don't see anything? Naruto exclaimed. Exactly, Orochimaru's curse seal is gone, she explained. It appears that when Orochimaru emerged from Sasuke's seal, he used the cursed seal as a medium to grow a body for himself, and that process completely removed the seal. Naruto smiled as he and Hanada walked out of the hospital hand in hand. It's a good thing he wasn't a Jinchuriki because he made himself a host by sealing Orochimaru's power into himself, but he failed to keep him contained when his chakra wasn't enough, Hanada said. He would have failed spectacularly. Ha ha ha, yay, trying to copy me, Naruto said solemnly, I will unseal him tomorrow. They'd wandered into one of the parks in the evening, standing under a tall umbrella-shaped tree as the sun set behind the village. What's going on, Naruto-kun? I was just thinking, Itachi did all that to his clan for the sake of his village, and above all, he spared his brother's life and gave him a reason to live, and even when Sasuke betrayed the village for which Itachi sacrificed everything and gained tainted power for his ambition, he saved him from Orochimaru's clutches when no one else could. That is what it means to have a family, Naruto-kun, Hanada said as she leaned in, the willingness to sacrifice everything for that person. I now see why you trusted Itachi, he knows what it means to be strong, and you are stronger to see that behind all the deception, Hanada said. We are ninja. Seeking the truth is part of our purpose, Naruto said before leaning in and kissing her, I love you Sukihana, and my heart will be yours forever. And my heart will always be yours, Itenpai.
As the last golden rays of the sun washed over them and the night began, they kissed passionately. But, as much as they wanted it to be a private affair, a ninja wearing a grey hooded cloak and a porcelain mask suddenly vanished from the shadows not far away. He assumed the couple had no idea he was there and that he had learned something important. But he was partially correct. He did obtain critical information, but he was not as undetected as he had assumed. There is an old adage that goes, if the enemy is in range, so are you. Despite this, Naruto and Hanada paid no attention to him. This was their time, and they would not acknowledge any outside presence at this time. After all, that had already been planned for. Meanwhile, just outside the effective radius of Storm Village, a masked ninja approached a tent disguised as a pile of rubble and boulders using Genjutsu. On the inside, he came into a dim light and saw a low table with three men seated around it. What do you have to report? Asked the one-eyed man, who was not looking at the newcomer. According to Hayuga Hanada, both Uchiha Itachi and Uchiha Sasuke are currently in the hospital and will survive, their most serious injury being severe chakra exhaustion, which was immediately cured, and Orochimaru's curse seal was removed from Uchiha Sasuke's person. Are you sure? He was actually successful? What about Naruto and Hanada's state? Inquired the man sitting next to him. The Anbu returned his gaze to Akahoshi, then to Danzo, who allowed him to respond with a slight nod. Hayuga Hanada appears to be tired, and Uzumaki Naruto is currently with her. It appears that our predictions were correct, the third and final speaker said, so I assume that the plan will begin tonight as planned? Yes, this is the best chance we will have. All of their attention will be dangerously divided between securing the Uchiha brothers and other relevant buildings, and Hanada's tiredness means she might sleep a little better. Best of all, the only members of the Jiryu no Urashi in the village are Riku-san and Tsubaki, and that woman doesn't stand a chance, she barely has more chakra than a genin, and Naruto hasn't named a tenth dragon yet, Akahoshi said, Riku-san, as the head of the Jiryu no Urashi, you will be able to go anywhere without question, so your job is that way, if something went wrong, we'd at least have access to medical care. Yes, but what about Hanada? She's a slightly better medic than Mika-san. That's where I come in, to deal with Uzumaki and Hanada, Danzo shifted in his seat, remembering Naruto's insult, I'll let my two best ninja apprehend Naruto and Hayuga. Apprehend? I requested that you kill them, Akahoshi objected. You intend to overthrow the leadership and take it for yourself, Danzo responded. If he is murdered in the dead of night and he is loved as much as you have me believe, then a mass uprising could occur and one of two things could happen. You could use the chaos to rise to power, and no one is the wiser, or you could use this to rise to power, and the people become suspicious of you, forcing me to kill you to ensure you keep your mouth shut. I assure you, Danzo-san, our deal will not be made public. Everyone knows how smooth you can be, Akahoshi argued. However, it is preferable that you execute him in public in order to break the spirits of those who may retaliate against you. Yes, but what about the Reizoku clan? Riku was curious. They swore a blood oath to give their lives to protect Naruto, which is why Tsubaki is always with him, and despite what you say, she is the strongest of her clan. As he leaned back in his seat, Akahoshi scoffed. None of those weaklings can stand up to me, he said, and they aren't all as loyal as you think. I know Tsubaki Uncle Kunz is a bitter man because he wasn't chosen to wield some pathetic weapon. As he peered over at his accomplice, Donzo's one visible cracked open slightly. So I'm assuming you'll be in charge of the Reizoku clan? Akahoshi gave a nod. How about the other, dragons, as you call them? Well, they are all loyal, Riku said, rubbing his chin as he considered what he would say next. Mira will resist at first, but she will eventually come around, Danjo will be the same as Mira because their clan is important to them, and Tonoko is not confident enough in himself to go against me. 
Shigur, Mataza, Kanta, and Jin are the true culprits. Mataza and Kanta have almost fanatical faith in Naruto and Hanada, while it is impossible to ever guess what is going through Shigur's mind, and Jin follows his own set of rules and is kind of like the invisible support that any ninja wishes they had. He, too, is difficult to predict how he will react. That is good to hear. However, we will have to put down those four, but Shigur will be spared per your request, Akahoshi-san. May I suggest something else, Danzo-san? What exactly is it? What if we break Mataza and use him to breed an entire new generation of ninja? That is unacceptable. He is a fanatic who will pose a threat to us. All threats must be eliminated. Akahoshi frowned at this but said nothing else. How about the waterfall village? There's always at least a handful of ninja there, and they're no slouch. Most of them are native to that place, so it'll be home field advantage, Riku inquired. Do I have reason to doubt you because the information you gave me said there would only be one Junin level ninja there? Of course not, Danzo san. I'm just saying don't underestimate anyone there, we slaughtered over 40 ninja not long ago, he reminded. I understand your concern, Danzo mocked, but my men aren't a horde of mindless Iwa shinobi marching into something they don't understand. My men are the elite of the elite, and they know exactly what they're getting themselves into. Besides, the maps Akahoshi provided should be very useful, and there are only 10 ninja guarding the waterfall. I see, Riku nodded, now that our plan has been finalized, when should we strike? It should be over by the time the sun comes up tomorrow. We will begin at exactly 2 a.m. Strike all at the exact same time, and rendezvous in Kanshisha's office after our work is completed, Danzo said. As he spoke, a sudden rustle of bushes outside the tent drew the attention of all the shinobi inside, and before anyone could blink, two masked shinobi descended upon the unfortunate spy, which turned out to be nothing more than a common lizard catching a cricket. The lizard never got to finish his meal because a kanai pierced his stomach, causing him to drop it. This caused all the other small critters, such as small animals and insects, to flee in all directions. A search of the surrounding area revealed that there were no ninja or humans for at least three miles. All right, gentlemen, I think I'll leave now, Riku said, picking up his nodashi at the door. I suppose I'll leave as well, Akahoshi said as he walked out of the tent with someone by his side, the same person who was by his side when he let the root Anbu escape. After they had both left, a pair of Donzo's Anbu appeared. Keep an eye on them. Kill Akahoshi if he betrays me, and make sure Riku's job is his last. They both vanished into the shadows without saying anything. All threats must be eliminated, and Hagen Riku, who had betrayed not one but two leaders, was the most dangerous of them all. When attempting to capture its prey, a lizard was killed by a kanai thrown by a root Anbu. The twig on which he was perched, however, was not strong enough to support his weight and snapped under his movement to capture the insect. He had caught the prey, but a kanai caught him before he could swallow it. The meal, along with whatever insect was in the bush, quickly fled the scene. But this cricket was having a bad evening because he was swooped up by a bird as soon as he was 40 meters away safely chirping away in a tree. But it didn't eat him nor did it carry the cricket to its nest, nor did the cricket struggle to escape. Instead, it carried the insect four miles away from the meeting before landing and releasing it in front of a red panda with a spider on his head. When the cricket saw the spider and the red panda, it hopped over to it and began chirping as if it was telling the group something. They all seemed to respond with chirps, grunts, or just aggravated looking scurrying. Following the alleged conversation, they all split up to go their separate ways. The bird flew off in the direction of the waterfall, picking up the cricket and allowing the spider to crawl on its back. The red panda climbed another tree, then another, until she came across a small hidden campfire where a pink-haired girl slept. 
For most people, this would have been dangerous, but when every animal, great and small, was your weapon, she could sleep anywhere. The panda approached her and nudged her. She only stirred but did not awaken. The panda nudged her again, but she did not awaken. When the panda became frustrated with the situation, he decided that a less aggressive approach might be best. So it went to her feet, pulled up the covers to expose her feet, and began licking it. It didn't take long before the girl turned vigorously and shot up laughing hysterically like a schoolgirl, only to see her familiar, Coco, crawling up her lap. No fair waking me up like that, you know I'm ticklish, she pouted cutely, you better have a good reason. She leaned in close to the panda, listening to what it had to say. While listening to the report, her eyes widened and then narrowed, indicating that she was in full ninja mode, as Naruto had once described. Shigur was as strange as ninja got, she was always happy and cheerful, and for a girl in her early twenties to act like a twelve-year-old schoolgirl was strange by any standards, but when a serious operation was going on, it seemed as if her emotions died and were locked away in the very depths of her soul. She looked at her watch and realized it was still eight o'clock at night, so she needed to pack up and leave right away. She packed up her camp and walked steadily towards her prey. She was on a mission, and her prey was probably the most dangerous of them all. Her target was none other than Danzo, the infamous councilman. On the Whirlpool and Fire Country border. Jugo, Karen, and Suigetsu had been tracking Mataza since they were abandoned. They had hoped to follow him all the way to Sasuke's mysterious teammate, but he became too far away for Karen to track his chakra halfway there. So they were now stranded somewhere on the border of fire country, with no money and no place to buy food, and to make matters worse, they were not far from rice field country. Oh no, what do we do now? It's late, and we have no idea where to go from here, Suigetsu grumbled. Would you shut up, Suigetsu? Retorted Karen, we should camp here for the night and continue in the morning. Ordinarily, they would have started arguing and attempting to kill each other by now, but with Jugo present, they couldn't. If they did, Jugo's other half might decide to take over, and they knew that without Sasuke, it was only a matter of time before he lost it. Needless to say, their patience was running thin. Alright, but. Suigetsu began but was interrupted by Jugo. I see a light over there. Perhaps someone there can assist us. They couldn't see why not, and they could save time by sharing a fire, or at the very least take advantage of whoever was stupid enough to start such a bright fire in such a dangerous place. They crept closer to the fire and noticed only one tent, a small one, indicating that there was only one person. Certainly stupid. Because there was no one around, they surveyed the camp before approaching. Hello, Jugo said. What in the world are you doing? Suigetsu screamed in hushed tones, which Jugo promptly ignored. Oh, Suigetsu, relax, Karen advised, the only chakra I sense is too far away. Fine, make yourself useful and see what's on that scroll, Suigetsu said, pulling a large scroll and a knapsack from the tent and beginning to look through them. However, Karen froze just as she opened the scroll and Suigetsu peered into the bag. Shit, that person is returning. Why are you getting antsy, I thought you said they were too far away, Suigetsu grumbled. Well, I meant they were too far away to notice anything over here, but that person is returning and will be here any minute. What does it matter, there are three of us and one of them. Yeah, they have a lot of chakra capacity as well. Now you tell me this, Suigetsu yelled angrily as he dropped his knapsack, come on, Let's get out of here. It's too late, they've sped up. Let's hide. They were about to do so when patches of ground rose up like toy towers, sprouting rods that clamped around their legs, ankles, arms, and torso like shackles before they could move. What in the world is this? Suigetsu inquired. Sorry about that, apologized a lovely green-haired girl, probably in her late teens or early twenties, 
but I sensed some chakra in my camp trying to flee as I approached, so I just had to react. We're sorry, we didn't mean to intrude, Jugo apologized. Yeah, just let us go and we'll be right on our way. I see, the woman explained, so why are you still clutching my scroll like that? Huh? Oh, sorry. Karen blushed as she handed back the scroll to the girl, I didn't realize I was still holding it. Well, no harm done, she said as she undid her just sue and placed the scroll near her tent. What? I inquired, are you hungry? I caught some fish and was hoping you wouldn't mind letting me have them. Do you think we're stupid or what? You caught us stealing, now you want to feed us, do you have any idea who you're dealing with? Suigetsu demanded angrily. Well, from the looks of it, she said as she skewered a fish and tossed it over the fire, three hungry teenagers who have no idea where they are. No, we're not, Karen insisted, pushing up the side of her glasses, I am quite intelligent and know where we are, and I would have you know, we already have our own food. Her traitorous stomach began to disagree as she said this, and the girl began to laugh. You're not fooling anyone. The girl laughed, not even your stomach. Take a seat, everyone, and let us share this warm fire. It's that obvious, huh, Karen admitted, blushing again and dropping her head, fine. With that, Karen, Jugo, and Suigetsu sat around the fire for a few minutes, Suigetsu more reluctant than the others, in an uneasy silence. The girl then took a bite out of one of the finished fishes, prompting the others to take one and eat, or two in Suigetsu's case. After finishing her fish, she turned to face the three. What in the world are you looking at? Suigetsu insisted. I'm sorry, but I've never seen anyone like you guys before, she explained, her voice filled with awe. You have to be the oddest people I've ever met. What exactly do you mean? Last time I checked, we were all pretty normal, and why are you asking questions like that when you haven't even given us your name? Karen questioned. Karen recognized that this girl was not your typical person. She got a small look into the scroll before they were captured by that strange jutsu of hers, and what she saw were instructions to perform some sort of jutsu, it wasn't enough to know for certain what kind of jutsu, but it was enough to know that this girl was a ninja, and by the way she had caught them, she was probably a good one. With that in mind, she was cautious in her response to the question. She only hoped that this person would not become suspicious of them and begin questioning them. It would be a shame if we had to kill her for being nosy, Karen thought, but with Jugo around, we should try not to aggravate him. Karen was correct, but the girl was a ninja, a far better ninja than any of them, as evidenced by the way her eyes flickered over to Jugo when she mentioned strange, or how Karen quickly changed the subject when she asked an innocent question. It appears that the girl isn't very good at keeping secrets, the girl reasoned, the short one appears to be the most capable fighter of the three, while the big one appears to be a bit different. Let's see how things go. Oh, sorry. My name is Uzumaki Akira, she lied calmly, and what's yours? Her clan's Kiki Jenke were well known in Kiri and Water Country, so telling them her name was Sukin Akira would have been counterproductive. When she mentioned Uzumaki, everyone's attention was drawn to her. Karen, Karen replied. Hazuka Suigetsu, Suigetsu said, unconcerned about who knew his name. Jugo of Tenpin. Jugo introduced himself. The reason I said you were all strange is because I have never seen anyone with that shade of pink, it's so pretty, Karen couldn't help but smile as Suigetsu scoffed and Jugo lightly laughed, and you have weird teeth, like a shark, all pointy and sticking out your mouth. Yeah, she's right, Karen said, he's like a shark, too stupid to do anything but eat and sleep. A complete waste of space. Watch it. Karen, Suigetsu said as he approached his sword, or you'll be fed to those sharks. As if, she said as she approached her kanai pouch. But you are the strangest of them all, Akira said, accusingly pointing at Jugo. Karen could see it in his eyes as he struggled to keep his other self in check. 
Jugo had always been a peace-loving individual, and the existence of his bloodthirsty other side was an affront to his very existence and reason for being. To make matters worse, a girl he'd never met before had correctly identified him as the anomaly, and as much as he tried, he couldn't keep it a secret from the rest of the world. That's why the next thing Akira said gave him hope. You're so big you could be a giant, and your hair is orange, Akira remarked, but I bet no one picks on you, huh? She gave him a hopeful look. He relaxed inwardly and let go of a breath he didn't realize he was holding, causing a now tense Suigetsu and Karen to visibly relax, though this all seemed to go over the mysterious girl's head. She, on the other hand, had seen it all. No, people are usually intimidated by my size, he replied, then abruptly changed the subject. I always thought Uzumaki was a place name, not someone's name. So you're hiding something, Akira reasoned, whatever it is, those two are afraid of something, and it has to do with Jugo. Yes, it is. Do you know anyone with that name? She inquired, hoping it was the person she had imagined. Not long ago, we met a guy, one of his subordinates called him Uzumaki-sama, so now I know it's his name and not a title, Karen concluded, Suigetsu, what did Sasuke say his old teammate's name was? Naruto, Suigetsu said, turning to Akira, you're not related to him, are you? It depends, you three don't seem to like each other at all, at least you two don't, she said, referring to Karen and Suigetsu rather than Jugo, and from the fact that you were clearly ninja and not wearing a hitai ite, I can only come to two conclusions. Oh, and what is that? Suigetsu said, reaching up to his zanbatu, sensing the girl's change in behavior. 1. He has something of common value to the three of you, she said as she looked at them, or 2. You're all looking for him, but for different reasons. So, which one is it? As she observed the three people's reactions and expressions, she smiled to herself, knowing that she had hit the nail on the head with the second option. The second one, Karen explained, do you know him? Could you help us find his village? Akira grinned. Fortunately for you, I was on my way to his village when I stopped for the night, Karen smiled, but you guys are hiding something, and a large part of it has to do with Jugo-san, so I don't really trust you. It's not that we're trying to deceive you. I have a split personality that is quite evil and enjoys nothing more than committing senseless murder, Jugo begged, please, I need to find him, for my sake and the sake of everyone around me. Akira looked at the other two and saw in Karen that her reasons, while not as forthright as Jugo's, were still genuine. Suigetsu, on the other hand, had a phony reason and appears to be willing to go to any length to obtain what he desired. Master Kiyosh had always claimed that she had the ability to read people's hearts. It was something that couldn't be fully taught, and Akira was far better at it than most. This, combined with her method of gathering information indirectly from others, a few books on psychology, and Master Kiyosh's training, meant that there was no one she couldn't get information from. Alright, she said, I'll take you all with me, but for now, I'm going to sleep. With that, she took up her scroll and entered the tent. Wait, Karen said, prompting Akira to turn around and look at her, you never told us your relationship to him. Hey, it seems Naruto-kun has left an impression on all of you, she said softly, and it's no surprise. But, if you're curious, I'm just. His precious big sister. With that, she turned and went into her tent, leaving three people to unpack their own sleeping mats and realizing that the person they were speaking with was possibly one of the most dangerous people they had ever met, and that they held the key to their future. Suigetsu, in particular, realized he had almost drawn his sword at someone who is the sibling of someone who could easily defeat Jugo and command ninja who could take out his entire team and Kisame in one swoop. Things are never as they appear in the shinobi world. A simple insect can kill anyone it chooses, or a puppy can hurl itself at you like a tornado and severely damage any opponent. However, depending on the markings and the people who wield them, these things can be noted and detected over time. 
This is exactly what Ninja had done in order to recognize these things for the threats that they are, but in Whirlpool Country, there are things that, even by Ninja standards, could never be identified as a threat, even if they carry vital information or can kill. Anyone watching a bird with an insect in its mouth would pay no attention or interest to it. They would simply dismiss it as a bird carrying food back to its nest, if they bothered to pay attention to such a thing at all. However, despite being a normal bird native to the area, this bird's mission had nothing to do with gathering food. It had already finished the first part of the mission by dropping the spider on its back in the waterfall caves. Its next almost completed task was to drop the cricket at the waterfall. The spider scurried along the cave walls and floor before arriving at a sort of village centered on a large tree. It crept into one of the houses and scurried up Kanta's arm. What news do you bring? He asked as the spider walked up his arm towards his ear and Tonoko looked at him expectantly. What time is it? May I venture to ask, what did it say? Tonoko inquired as he sat across from them at the dining table. At 2 a. m. A traitor plans to overthrow, and they come for water here, he said as the spider vanished in a puff of smoke. Then it appears that we have much to do before then to prepare for our guests, Tonoko said as he stood up and left the house to prepare, followed by Kanta. It is now half past 8 o'clock. Office of Kinshisha Naruto had returned to his office not long after a frantic Machiko discovered him and Hanada snuggled up at the base of the tree shortly after the sun had set. To make a long story short, he now had to complete all of the paperwork himself before leaving for home, and he couldn't leave because Hanada was keeping a Byakugan on him from their home. He should not have attempted to sneak away from his work again. I'm sure a Hokage wouldn't have to do things like this in her village, Naruto grumbled as he stamped another document. How many cages wished that were the case? He heard a tapping at the glass window behind him after stamping yet another document to approve certain changes to the academy. He swiveled in his chair and noticed a bird flying away from the window sill. Following the strange occurrence, he noticed a cricket still trying to get in. When he opened the window, the cricket jumped onto his desk, into the ink, and started walking all over the documents. When he realized what the cricket was doing, whatever he was about to say died on his lips. It was writing a message on the documents, its path forming the kanji, attack, and the number, too. Naruto looked at the strange occurrence, then smiled and returned to his work, knowing that the bird would relay the same message to Hanada, as she could simply summon one of her birds to translate. Shigur keeping an eye on the traitors was a good idea, because her spies ranged from the smallest fleas to the most powerful summon beasts. It starts at 2, Naruto said, a dark smile on his lips as he considered what he would do to those traitors. It is now 9 o'clock at night. Earlier in the day, in aim. Pain. Conan said as she approached the orange-haired man who was sitting on the ledge where he had fought Jiraiya, he has come to see you. Very well, he said as he and Conan made their way to the central tower a, where he stayed. When they arrived, they noticed a man wearing an orange mask standing in the middle of the room. Despite the fact that they couldn't see his face due to his mask, they could tell he was angry. Zetsu has not given me any information on the fight between Itachi and Sasuke, Payne said dryly, unconcerned about the legendary ninja in front of him. After all, he is a god. That's one of the reasons I'm here, he explained, but first, what about Jiraiya? He's far better than most people give him credit for and could be a real hindrance. I assume Jiraiya-sensei is dead for Uchiha Sasuke and Uchiha Itachi? So, it's time to get the Kyubi, Payne said as the rain continued to fall outside. The man in the mask laughed to himself. Whether he admits it or not, he is a product of Konoha, Madara reflected fondly, funny how the most powerful members of Akatsuki have been trained by Konoha, or at least by a ninja of it. Yes, he has grown far stronger and more cunning than I had anticipated, Madara said, 
So as the leader, you do it, and if you come across Itachi and Sasuke, kill them both. There is no need to describe our adversary in this manner, Conan said, Pain has never lost a fight. That is correct. Madara said as he turned to leave, I have said what I came to say, tell the other members to hurry up and capture their own Jinchuriki. Pain and Conan watched Madara leave in a slow and steady gait, ranting about how things would soon be back to normal, as he reclaimed the true power of the Sharingan, his power. Despite popular belief, Danzo was a very loyal man, more loyal than any ninja in Konoha, or so he thought. He was so loyal that he would go to any length to ensure Konoha's safety, even if it meant hiding in the shadows and doing things the fools would not approve of. He was willing to pay any price and commit any atrocity to ensure Konoha's supremacy. Unfortunately, he was a very ambitious man, and his ambition sometimes clashed with his loyalty. This led him to believe that the current Hokage were all too weak to truly lead Konoha. Every previous Hokage, including the current one, was a bleeding heart who catered too easily to the whims of other villages. Had he been Hokage, he would have served the head of the Kumo ambassador on a silver platter when the attempted abduction of the Hyuga heiress failed, Uchiha Sasuke and Uchiha Itachi would have been killed along with the rest of their traitorous clan, and the Jinchuriki would have been properly trained as the weapon he should have been for Konoha, rather than living some childish fantasy. This was one of many stories he had told himself over the years as one incident after another occurred, and his ambition was fed and inflated by his loyalty as a result. Because of his perspective on the shinobi world, he frequently did things that called his loyalty into question. He would blame the Sandame for his weakness when the Sand and Sound invaded, but anyone with enough knowledge and understanding would surely suspect he was involved in Orochimaru's invasion. Despite the fact that Sandame allowed the traitorous Sanin to flee, it was Danzo who allowed him back in. This was a mistake, because his actions had indirectly resulted in the defection of Uchiha Sasuke and the loss of a very valuable shinobi in Uzumaki Naruto. He'd deny it, but he'd done what needed to be done. It wasn't the first time his actions had resulted in more harm than good. Pain is perhaps the best example of this. Pain despised Konoha because of what happened to his parents, but it was another Konoha ninja who gave him the strength to strengthen his country, and he revered that Konoha nin. Even though Jiraiya had lost so much, it was Danzo's action when he and Hanzo joined forces to betray Yahiko's group that had healed a hole in his heart. Hanzo wanted to keep his position, and Danzo wanted to see the first step of his ambition, becoming Hokage, come true, but in the end, Yahiko died, and whatever last bit of faith Nagato had in humanity died, and the man known as Pain was born, and Danzo remained blameless and had no regrets. After all, a united aim posed no threat to Konoha. At least, that's what he'd tell himself after another failed attempt to become Hokage. If there was one thing he regretted, it was the death of his rival, despite the fact that he still referred to the Sandame Hokage as a fool on a regular basis. He had always been envious of how people admired and practically worshipped the Sandame, but he would remain loyal, and when the time came for him to lead Konoha as Hokage, he would restore it to the days when its greatness could not even be rivaled or questioned. But there was one sad truth about Danzo's loyalty. It was fanaticism, fanaticism unto himself, which is why his personal motto was that all threats should be eliminated, and for this reason, he was in the new whirlpool country assisting a power-hungry fool in his quest to overthrow Arashi's leadership. To him, the entire situation posed a threat to Konoha. The leader was a powerful ninja who was hosting an even more powerful biju who had once been a Konoha ninja, his most trusted lieutenant was another former Konoha ninja, and to make matters worse, she had willingly abandoned Konoha to be with him. He would not have gone to such lengths to form an alliance with the madman if it had just been that, but they had control of a number of powerful ninja as well as access to very powerful and destructive jutsu, weapons, drugs, and information. He couldn't take the risk of forming an alliance with Konoha. The risk was too great. If Arashi decided to attack Konoha, there would be little they could do, especially with Konoha's weak leadership. He would put an end to this situation. 
However, in order to keep the bloodline in Konoha's hands, he would not only destroy the Storm Village and all of Naruto's most loyal followers, as well as the Hyuga girl, but he would also kill all of the Arashi ninja who had assisted in the coup. He wouldn't do it because he didn't trust him. If that were the case, he'd be dead by now. The reason for this was that Danzo was certain that that fool Akahoshi would not keep his mouth shut, but this was a minor issue. The other reason was that Akahoshi was a power-hungry lunatic with ambitions as great as Orochimaru's but not enough sense to do something stupid like try to gain more power. So the answer was simple. Danzo would kill the man and take everything he had graciously discussed, including Naruto's three scrolls, the two elemental swords, the star of Hoshi village, and the water of Waterfa, village, not to mention the location, which would make an excellent hiding place and fort. Above all, the most important thing was how he planned to re-educate Naruto. He wasn't so stupid as to kill a Jinchuriki and risk the beast it contained escaping. No, he'd keep him as a personal pet and weapon, a pet who could help him rise to the position of Hokage. This was especially on his mind as he sat in his chair inside the Genjutsu covered tent miles away from Arashi. By the time the sun rises, I'll be one step closer, he reasoned, but how should I restrain that boy? Suppression seals would only hold back his chakra, and his stubbornness would take months to break. When an Anbu appeared near his seat, he paused his musings and slowly opened his eye. There is someone heading straight for us. Her description matches Hikari Shigura of the Jiryu no Urashi, he said, what are your orders? The agreement was that she would be spared, but Danzo had other plans, and as his motto goes, all threats must be eliminated. Hi, the Anbu said before disappearing. However, this turn of events made him think that there should be no reason for anyone, especially one of the Jiryu, to be heading in this direction. It made no sense. Their location was chosen because no one came here and there was no reason to come here. After all, there was no point in killing your allies before you got what you wanted, and Danzo had seen it in his eyes, Akahoshi was far too power hungry to betray him before he got the power he desired. There could only be one reason for this. The entire plot had already been discovered, and there was a traitor among them. It couldn't have been one of his own. He'd taken precautions to ensure that, so it could only mean that one of those involved in the overthrow was a deliberate plant. To make matters worse, the attacks had already begun at the same time a few minutes before. But why wait until the last moment to launch a counter-attack, it doesn't make much sense, he reasoned as his hands clenched around his cane, unless, of course, it is to ensure that someone previously out of their grasp is now in their hands. There is no better trap than when your target walks into your hands. Danzo was not the type to get angry or show emotion. In fact, he may have lost the ability to do so a long time ago, but if he could, his face would have twisted into an ugly scowl and he would have been tossing and overturning tables, but he remained calm. He would have to think about it. He'd have to abandon the mission because he could see it had already failed, and he'd have to leave as soon as possible because they knew he was here and had even sent an assassin, though he questioned the skill of any would-be assassin who would walk up to the enemy's hiding place in broad daylight, but that was beside the point. He'd have to abandon his ninja and flee if the mission failed. Despite this, he was confident that his ninja were intelligent enough to recognize when a mission needed to be abandoned and returned for further instructions, especially since the mission was supposed to be quick and silent. Danzo simply rose to his feet and called a few names, and within seconds, the people he had summoned were bowing before him, awaiting his orders. Get ready to leave right away. We've been discovered. What about the mission? One person inquired. It was a setup, he simply stated, a trap set by a deceptively good adversary. Now go. The gathered ninja vanished, and they began their escape in a matter of moments. However, as they were about to leap away, Danzo was forced to leap out of the way as a pink light shot out from the nearby trees, impaling two of his men who attempted to take the blow for him. 
It appears that you are a lot better than I gave you credit for, Danzo said, opening his eye and looking at the source of the attack, Hikari Shigur. The sword retracted as the two men slumped to the ground, one wounded but likely to survive, the other not so much. After the pink light of the sword faded, a pink-haired girl leapt from the tree and faced her adversaries, seven men in masks and one seemingly elderly man. Her eyes were cold as she stared at the man who was her target. She knew nothing about him, and worse, there were seven others to worry about. She knew nothing about them either, except that they were, in some strange way, Konoha Shinobi, so they would at least have some semblance of that kind of fighting style. That didn't change the fact that Danzo was a complete enigma, appearing far too calm and relaxed, as if he had already seen the future. But perhaps that was why she had been assigned to this mission. She, too, was an enigma known only to the Jiryu, Naruto, and Hanada. Even Akahoshi had no idea the extent of her power or that it had manifested itself into a Keke Jenke. All he knew was that she was the first person to survive the star training. In other words, she used Hijutsu, and you use Hijutsu when dealing with unknown opponents. 2 AM at the former Waterfall Village's waterfall. Three Chinin were chatting aimlessly while keeping an eye on their surroundings. Their position was carefully chosen to allow them to easily survey the area for any intruders or travelers while remaining completely invisible to the outside world. It would be difficult to catch them off guard unless one knew where to look. However, four masked root Anbu were rapidly closing in on their location, and they were not only very well informed, but they moved swiftly and quietly like a leaf descending from a tree. Despite this, sneaking up on them was not as simple as the Anbu had first imagined. This was demonstrated when the three Chinin were able to avoid a hail of Kanai that would have killed all three of them. Shit, we're under attack, and they look like Konoha Anbu, muttered the commander, a man in his early thirties, Karu, go inform Tonoko-sama immediately, and Higan, return to the village immediately and inform Kanshisha-sama about this betrayal. What are you going to do, Hanataro-san? Karu asked, keeping an eye on the four masked ninja, surely you aren't going to try and hold off all four of them. We have no choice, he said, not daring to look away from the four shinobi, so go you too, the faster you go, the better my chances of survival. Very well, Higan said, passing Karu a glance, but before I go. What? Ak. Hanataro had been so focused on the four Anbu that he didn't notice when the kanai slid into his side. What does this mean? He yelled angrily as blood poured from his kidney wound. We are tired of some outsider calling the shots. Naruto and that woman appeared out of nowhere and uprooted us from our homes, Karu declared. He gave us a better life, a stronger system, and powerful allies, Hanataro begged, how could you betray him and all of us in such a way? But before Karu could respond, Higan struck Hanataro on the temple with the blunt end of a kanai. We have no time for this, he said, turning to face the four ANBU's stoic forms, we have been expecting you. I assume you are in league with Akahoshi-san? One of the Anbu inquired, followed by, what information do you have for us? There are ten Chinin and one dragon guarding the caves in the village within, and there are three others on our side, Higan said, pointing to the downed Hanataro. I'd need to know the exact location of everyone in the area, said the same Anbu. We'll take you right to them, Karu said. That is unacceptable, the same Anbu said, adding that a crude map of the pathways and structures, if any, indicating the locations of foe and allies would suffice. Karu looked suspiciously at the four Anbu before Higan relented. Very well, he said, pulling out a blank scroll and a pen, give me a few moments, I know the entire system intimately, and it is quite complex. As Higan finished the rudimentary map, Karu noticed one of the Anbu approach him, and before he knew it, he and his partner were caught in the hands of the Anbu, and then there was an audible snap, and both traitorous men dropped lifelessly to the ground. Study this map, the same Anbu said as the apparent captain of this unit, 
and when you scour the caves in the village inside, kill everything in your path and leave the dragon to me, now go. Three of the four Anbu vanished with a wave of his hand, and as he was about to discard the map, a spider fell from an overhanging branch onto the paper. When the Anbu looked up at the branch, he noticed a web above it. Without further thought, he flicked off the spider that was now crawling on his arm, set fire to the map, and walked towards the waterfall. However, as he walked away, the spider that the Anbu had flicked off his arm crawled over Hanataro's dead body, which had been replaced by a humanoid mass of spiders similar to the first. It scampered around the spider swarm, stopping and going at individual spiders before the swarm vanished in a plume of smoke, revealing that they were all summoned spiders. Six spiders, including the first, vanished into the ground through tiny holes after the smoke cleared, only to reappear minutes later in the waterfall village at the foot of Kanta and Tonoko. Kanta san, six of your summons have returned, Tonoko noticed, does this mean the enemy has arrived? As he spoke, one of the spiders crawled up Kanta's leg to his ear, and after a few seconds, Kanta tossed the spider to the floor. Show me, he demanded. At this command, the six spiders began weaving a web at breakneck speed, but unlike normal webs, this web had channels that resembled the tunnel system's pathways inside the waterfall. After that, the spiders marked three locations on the spider web map. If I may venture a guess, Tonoko began, but what are they up to? They make a map of the entire waterfall village, he explained as the six summons vanished, those three are where three traitors are and they say four enemy coming, they kill first two traitors. Well done Kanta San, it appears that Akahoshi ally Sans is even more untrustworthy than Akahoshi San himself, Tonoko said as he rose from his squatting position. Shall we go greet our guests and dispense some well-deserved punishment? Kanta simply nodded, and Tonoko walked away. The truth is that there were only nine Chenin in the caves. The tenth Chenin, Hanataro, was created by Kanta's spider summons to determine who was trustworthy and who was not, and to determine whether Akahoshi would attempt to take the waterfall. However, it received nothing until it died. Since Naruto returned from his trip to the leaf, Kanta and Tonoko had been given a secret assignment. So here they are. Two dragons, three traitors, four clueless Chenin just doing their job who may be killed tonight, and four intruders hell bent on killing everyone in sight. Kanta began a series of hand seals as Tonoko left to warn the four Chenin. Kachiyose no jutsu, he says. A large 20-foot spider with three eyes and six spiny legs emerged from the smoke that indicated the technique's success. It fixed its attention on Kanta. Why have you summoned me, Kanta? It asked, staring at Kanta's crazed expression. Jirai Gumo, I summon you to kill my enemy, he said to the dark and burnt orange spider, they wear white masks, do whatever you want to them only, leave others alone. The four Anbu had split up and attacked four different targets. The plan was that because each Chenin was guarding a portion of the caves individually, they would take out the four not loyal to Akahoshi first and then move on to the Lone Dragon, but when they all arrived at the location indicated on the map, they all discovered that their targets were not there. When one of the Anbu saw this, he narrowed his eyes. Something strange is going on here, he thought. As he retraced his steps to rejoin his comrades, his eyes widened, and in the blink of an eye, he whirled around and tossed a pair of kanai at whatever had crept up on him. The kanai, on the other hand, sailed unimpeded through the cave's shadows. Despite the false alarm, the Anbu did not relax his guard. Instead, he pulled out another kanai and pressed himself against the wall, believing that the missing Chenin was stalking him. However, as he clung to the wall, his senses stretched to their limits, he suddenly felt a presence above him as a glob of a thick fluid landed on him. When he looked up, he saw a three-eyed spider twice or three times the size of a horse only three inches away from him. He attempted to leap away from the creature, but it struck out faster than the obese creature thought it could and stabbed him in the chest with its stinger, paralyzing him. 
The masked man was caught before he hit the ground and quickly wrapped in silk and dragged away behind the spider. There are three more to go. Meanwhile, as the captain of the Anbu squad was returning to meet his comrades, he unexpectedly jumped out of the way of a spinning comma, only to jump again to avoid another, but he was not quick enough the second time and received a deep slash on his left leg. To his credit, he did not scream in agony, but instead threw himself against a wall to gain a defensible position. He was scanning his surroundings with a kanai. He was about to leap away from the wall behind him when he heard a rumbling. A razor chain sprouted from the wall and darted towards him. He deflected it with his kanai, but as it was deflected, it landed next to one of the two kama and attached itself to it before falling limp to the ground. The Anbu didn't have time to think because as the chain died, a person erupted from the wall holding the other end. Good night, Anbu-san, he said politely, my name is Sasarama Tanoko, and this evening I shall be your executioner. The Anbu simply stared at the man holding the weapon. The Anbu was bleeding profusely from his leg wound, and it wouldn't be long before he passed out. That comma must have contained wind chakra, he reasoned, better finish this quickly, this mission has been jeopardized. My name is unimportant, and you are my executioner, the Anbu said quickly, Katen, Gukaku. It left no room for Tonoko to dodge as it barreled towards him, giving the injured Anbu enough time to flee. Tonoko, on the other hand, channeled wind chakra into his chain and began spinning it quickly. The fireball stopped dead in its tracks at the chain due to the wind-natured chakra and the motion of the chain and comma, grew, and then was redirected back to the direction of the retreating Anbu. Tonoko did not stop there, however, and began a string of hand seals. Gyaku Akamua Senpu no Jutsu Futon The normal Akuma Senpu is a whirlwind that sucks in and tears the victim apart, making it appear as if the user is sucking them into his mouth, but this version does the opposite and is simply an outgoing whirlwind, and the retreating Anbu was cooked alive as he struggled to get away with a crippled leg and a dizzy head due to the interaction of wind and fire natured chakra. Tonoko collected the other Kama and reconnected it to his razor chain before continuing to walk in the direction of the Anbu, swinging his chain at a slow pace. He found himself walking towards a large intersection a few minutes later. His senses alerted him to a threat from behind as he walked into the area. He was unable to flee in time and was apprehended from behind with a kanai at his throat, but before the kanai was dragged across his throat, he managed to block the offending weapon with one of his kama while the assailant held his other hand in place. It appears that we have reached a deadlock, sir, Tonoko said. Do you think that? The Anbu asked as his kanai pressed harder against the kama, inches away from Tonoko's throat. Yes, Tonoko replied, as if his life didn't depend on it, Akahoshi's minions have been removed, and I have already killed your partner. You think there's only two of us? He asked as the blade got closer and Tonoko's hand strained. I killed this one, and Jirai Gumo feasts on the other, Kanta said as he dropped another masked body to the ground. We are not without mercy, Tonoko explained, because you were under orders and your superior Danzo is acting as hired help, we have the ability to spare your life today, and you received no prior warning. I'm not afraid to die for Konoha, said the Anbu. My friend, Tonoko said, the blade inches from his carotid artery, what Danzo is doing does not help Konoha in any way. All he does is create more enemies, and there are worse things than death. Tonoko tilted his head to the side to show him what he meant, revealing a spider emerging from one of the passages. If the Anbu was afraid, he didn't show it, or maybe he couldn't, but it was the last thing he felt as he mustered what remaining strength he had to at least take out one of the enemies before he went. However, as the blade began to pierce Tonoko's throat, a golden spear embedded itself into the back of his neck and through his mouth, killing him instantly. As the body fell to the ground, Tonoko leapt away, taking no chances as blood trickled down his neck. Thank you, my friend, Tonoko rubbed Kanta's neck, a moment later and Kanshisha-sama would have been down one dragon. Kanta smiled at the joke, 
but it looked more like a killer's grin than a happy smile. He declined his summons. As they smiled and walked away to question the three traitors Tonoko had captured earlier, the body of the fallen root Anbu burst into flames, reducing the core to nothing but ash. I feel sorry for Konoha, Tonoko said as they walked towards the house where he had placed the three, because they have a separate organization that works independently of their leader, and all the minions are not loyal to Konoha, but blindly loyal to the leader of the organization. They kept walking until they came to the house. Four Chenin took up positions guarding the house on the outside, two on the outside and two on the inside. When they got closer, the two on the outside tensed, expecting anything and ready to fight if the Tonoko and Kanta in front of them were not what they seemed, but as they got closer, Tonoko and Kanta said something that made the two relax. Should we notify Storm of this incident, Tonoko-sama? Not yet, he replied as Kanta entered the house, but this is happening at the village as well, so we should stay here and hope we don't come under attack again, so I would like for you two to stand guard at the waterfall's entrance while Kanta and I get some information from the three inside. Yes, Tonoko-sama, right away, but before we go, could you do one thing for us? What is it? He inquired, adding, I will do my best if I can. Make it as agonizingly painful as possible when you extract information from those three traitors, the Chenin said, gritting his teeth. The sound of a pain-filled screen filled the air as he said this, causing the two Chenin to grin. I don't think you need to be concerned. Kanta San appears to be quite dissatisfied with them. Thank you, he said before sprinting towards the entrance to take defensive positions. 2 AM in Storm Village, Hospital. A person walking into a hospital, even at 2 AM, is nothing unusual, but this man was neither a medic nor a patient because he had no injuries. Instead of questioning his purpose for being there, the Chenin guarding the hospital and the nurses and med nins that littered the hospital ignored the occurrence. The reason for this was that he was Hagen Riku, the blind Nodashi and captain of the Juryu no Urashi, so whatever business he had in the hospital was either Naruto's or his own, and no one would want to get in the way of one of the village's top 14 ninja. As he approached his targets, he hoped beyond hope that Naruto had a plan and that he didn't have to do what he was about to do. Flashback you summoned me, Kanshisha-sama? Riku asked as he got down on one knee in front of Naruto in a private meeting chamber in the Storm Village's ninja-only section. Riku would not normally address Naruto by his title, but as he entered the room, he sensed a seriousness around him. Yes, come make yourself comfortable, Naruto said as he sat across from Riku, do you remember this place? Yes. This is where you were named our Kanshisha, and you chose us nine to be the Juryu no Urashi, Riku replied, before a look of confusion crossed his face. Is this what you've called me for, Kanshisha-sama? Naruto scrutinized him like a specimen under a microscope. He wasn't as good at observing people as Hanada or Akira, but he was a great judge of character. But in order for this to work, he must be certain of Riku, certain that he will not simply betray him. You were involved in the attempt to assassinate the former Mizukage, weren't you? Naruto asked, his voice steely, and as a result, many people do not trust you and believe that I chose you incorrectly. I understand, and you are correct to question my loyalty. I would have been disappointed if you did not, Riku said but I will not try to justify my actions against a tyrant who has plunged his country into anarchy. That's a very good answer, Riku, Naruto said, smiling. What do you mean, Kanshisha-sama? Riku inquired, sensing a shift in mood. I have a very important mission that only you can complete, Naruto explained, what do you think of Akahoshi? Feel free to speak freely. You should have killed him the first time you got the chance, Riku stated flatly. I do not know him personally, but from what I have gathered, he is a man who selfishly and greedily craves power. Your decision to give him a second chance was foolish because from my experience, those who crave power for selfish reasons will never change and will do anything to attain any power. 
I see, Naruto said, taking in everything Riku said, I, too, was skeptical about my decision, but I believed that he could be beneficial, but now. What happened? Riku inquired. One of the first books my master made me read was written by a great strategist, and in it he said, everyone has a purpose, whether they are brave, cowardly, or greedy. What does that have to do with Akahoshi? Riku inquired. Even though he is power hungry, he is greedy and a coward, so I made him my advisor, so his cowardly ways would teach me to be cautious and his greedy ways would teach me how to properly handle money, but I don't trust him, so when the time comes that he can no longer serve his purpose, he will be dealt with accordingly. How will I do it? Riku wondered. If he decides to betray me and try to overthrow me, he'll need help, powerful help with free reign and movement over the village, someone he thinks he can easily persuade to betray, someone he knows has already betrayed his leader, Naruto saw Riku's understanding look. Someone like me, he said, straightening his back and staring at Naruto, and for a brief moment, Naruto forgot Riku was blind, what must I do? I have already informed the others, so if he or someone under him approaches you, accept the offer and try to make it convincing, Naruto said. You are allowed to reveal any secrets that you deem necessary about the Jiryu, and if possible inform me as to what secrets have been revealed, any mission you must undertake then do it, but not without prior notice. Understood, Riku said before being dismissed. For your sake, Akahoshi, don't betray me, Naruto thought as he walked away. Flashback Conclusion So, without any difficulties, Riku made his way to the two private rooms, one of which housed Uchiha Itachi and the other Uchiha Sasuke. He did a few quick hand seals before reaching the corridor he wanted to go down, and the corridor in front of him was quickly covered in a thick layer of mist. Using the cover, he crept into Sasuke's room first, and after a quick glance to ensure he was in the right room with the right victim, he drew his nodashi from his sheath resting on his back and quickly beheaded the boy. He then went to Itachi's room and took his head as well. The guards outside the door were perplexed because they had not heard anything, but when they went to check on the two, they discovered that both Uchiha had died. As they scrambled to find the culprit, Hagen Riku, the blind Nodashi and master of the silent kill, casually walked out of the hospital, leaving no one the wiser. I hope you know what you're doing, Kanshisha sama Riku said as he approached the tower. Naruto and Hanada's house at 2 a.m. If one were to walk into the main entrance of Arashigakure no Sado, they would notice a large cliff face to the left that extended for roughly a mile beyond it, and the formation itself extended until it met the ocean. A small but dense forest stood in front of the cliff. Beyond the dense forest and cliff wall was Arashigakure no Sado, a ninja-only area where secret gatherings could be held with the entire shinobi populace of the storm, where young academy students received ninja training, and where the proud ninja of the storm honed their skill to new heights. To the right, which was the east and directly in front, one could see the thriving economy due to the many shops and traders, but if one strolled along to the east, they would come across a port where many merchant ships were moored. The tower was directly in front, and further back were residential areas, and even further back were dense woods and clearings, with many houses becoming mansions as prestige and power came to the owners of these clans. But, above all, there was one site that stood out above all others. The storm village was surrounded by water on three sides. One clan residence stood out from the rest not because of its size or splendor. It was both in size and splendor. It was built on a large plot of land in the style of an old-fashioned Japanese mansion, with a dojo off to the side. At the back was a beautiful garden with a pond in the center and koi swimming in it beneath the lily pads that decorated the surface, as well as fallen tsubaki and sakura flowers that hung lazily yet beautifully over the crystal water at opposite ends of the pond, and Naruto and Hanada sat next to each other, under the tsubaki tree. While Hanada snuggled against his bare chest, Naruto wore only black shinobi pants taped to his ankles and a pair of tabies. She wore only a pair of black tights that reached her mid-thigh, bandages that bound her surprisingly ample breasts, and tabies on her feet. They were nestled together under a grey overcoat, 
looking out over the water, with a wooden staff balanced in the center of the pond on a boulder. At first glance, it appears to be an old wooden staff with a polished surface from use. But it was Master Kiyosh who gave Naruto the elemental swords of wind and water. He and Hanada had carried them once or twice, Naruto carrying wind and Hanada carrying water, but they never had cause to use them, especially since the original scabbard was the only thing that could not only conceal the blades, but also withstand the power of the blades. What a pleasure to see you two together on such a lovely night, nay, Naruto-sama. From behind them, a cute voice said. Naruto noticed Shigur behind the tree. What makes you wear that disguise? I know it's you, Akahoshi, Naruto said to the girl. The henge vanished in a puff of smoke as he said this, revealing Akahoshi with a smirk on his face. I thought my little disguise would have fooled you, Akahoshi said as he walked to the side of the tree, revealing himself to Naruto and Hanada, but I suppose no disguise can hide from her eyes. Yes, Naruto replied, but there was no need to go that far. We both sensed your approach. Ah, I see, he explained as he crossed the water to the elemental blades, but how did you know it was me and not Shigur? Naruto and Hanada were watching him intently as he picked up the staff and twirled it around his hands. It's because Shigur's chakra isn't like the rest of the ninja who went through the star training. You could say her chakra is something quite special, Naruto explained as he and Hanada stood up, their gazes fixed on him, but why are you here this late? A slow grin spread across Akahoshi's face. He was facing Naruto and Hanada with his back to them, but when he turned around, they could see the twisted glee in his eyes and on his lips. He stared into Naruto's eyes as he walked back to the land, standing seven feet in front of Naruto and stomping the staff on the ground, completely ignoring Hanada. Your time has come, boy, he grumbled, it was brief, but I will be reclaiming the power you once denied me by taking what was mine and then some, it is only fitting given the humiliation I endured. What exactly do you mean? Naruto inquired, feigning anger and surprise. It's simple, he said, drawing a sword from one side of the staff, I will take the star that is rightfully mine, the water of the great tree, your throne is Kanshisha, your three scrolls that contain your ninjutsu, fuinjutsu, and the instructions to this. He paused and looked at the staff as he said this. Two of the elemental blades, which are said to have the power to grant whoever wields them the power to control the elements themselves and rule the world, he said before snapping his finger and Naruto and Hanada were on their knees with their arms pinned behind their backs. Naruto clenched his teeth and fixed his cold, furious gaze on Akahoshi, producing just enough killing intent to make the man sweat. When Naruto looked around, he saw nine ninja in porcelain masks, two of whom were tying him and Hanada together. How could you betray us, Akahoshi? Naruto raged. I spared your life and gave you a second chance. How could you betray us? Akahoshi only laughed as he tightened his grip on the staff. You are a fool, he simply stated, but for my plans to work, I would have to let you live for the time being, but your bitch here will not be so fortunate, despite the fact that she does look. Ravishing. If you touch a hair on her head, I will sentence you to death. Akahoshi only smiled in response to the remark. He approached Hinata and yanked a lock of her hair, not pulling it out, but just hard enough for her to feel the pain. You are in no position to make threats, he said before an idea struck him, and from the expression on his face, it was not going to be good for Naruto or Hinata, you know what, as my first act as the Azukage, I think I will dispatch your little girlfriend here with your very own weapon. One of the Anbu who was holding Hanada motioned for another, who quickly grabbed her by the hair and yanked her head forward, exposing her neck. As he slowly pulled on the handle of the blade, Akahoshi saw an evil smirk instead of anger, hatred, fear, or any other negative emotion in Naruto's eyes. This only made Akahoshi angry, and as a result, he didn't notice the ANBU's shocked expression or the blood pouring out of the stomp where his hand should have been. He became aware of this when he raised his hands only to discover that he couldn't feel them. 
When he saw the bloody appendage, he let out a blood-curdling scream that would have woken the rest of the village if Naruto's house wasn't so far away. The nine Anbu were all perplexed by the sight. It was not easily noticed, if at all. They didn't flinch, and neither did the people holding Naruto and Hanada. What in the world happened? What did you do to my hand? He asked, looking down at his hand on the ground, still clutching the sword. Naruto chuckled, but before anyone could stop him, the elemental blade of wind began to disintegrate into the wind and reformed itself in Naruto's hand, and before the pair of Anbu holding him could react, he twirled the sword, causing the sharp side of the weapon to make contact with the two ANBU's wrists, and with another fluid movement, he turned and cut their heads off so fast that they actually turned their heads before it. As this happened, two water spouts in the shape of hands erupted from the pond and grabbed the two ninja who were holding Hanada down. The water hands that engulfed the two ninja completely engulfed them and then increased in pressure until not only all of the air was forced out of their bodies, but cracking and grinding noises were heard before they were dropped to the ground as nothing more than a wet broken heap. The remaining five ninja all jumped back and looked at the pair warily as Akahoshi writhed and whimpered on the ground in pain, attempting to stop the blood loss. Hanada took up the scabbard with her sword still in it, and Naruto handed her the blade of wind, which she sheathed immediately and returned to its rocky perch with the water hand. Naruto and Hanada's expressions changed from angry to blank, with no emotion visible and no killing intent felt. This caused the ninja to either relax their guard or tense up even more for battle, but they all tensed when they saw the two take identical stances. The remaining Anbu took their own stances and drew their swords. They were all wary of the two, given Naruto's incredible speed, strength, and skill in taijutsu, as well as Hanada's apparent advanced skill in Juken, which allowed her to inflict internal wounds without even touching her opponent. What frightened them the most was that the stance they were in was not the one they had heard of. It was completely different. The hands were neither made into fists nor fully opened. The fingers were curled in and the palm was left open. What they didn't realize was that this was the opening stance of Odaiku Kotetsu, and that their lives were about to end because this style should only be used under one of two conditions, sparring with someone as skilled as you, or killing your opponent without hesitation or remorse. Let's put an end to this farce, Naruto said, and he and Hanada lashed out at the remaining Anbu. Naruto was faster than Hanada, so he caught his opponent off guard, with a gaping hole in his chest where his heart should have been. The chakra in Naruto's strike, combined with the force of the strike and the combined skill of mastering both closed and open-handed combat, literally blasted a hole in his torso. As Naruto did this, he wasted no time in moving on to his next opponent. Hanada's opponent was quick enough to parry the strike intended for his stomach with his left hand to his left side, but the act of parrying rendered his left hand useless from the elbow, and he failed to parry the strike far enough away from him. He heaved, but in that split second, he countered. Hanada's midsection was open due to the parry, or so he thought, because as the Anbu tried to cleave her with a diagonal overhead swing, her left hand moved faster than he thought possible, catching and breaking his wrist, allowing the weapon to drop from his hands. Hanada caught the swords and sliced open his stomach with fluid motion, but she soon felt a searing heat coming from behind the man. Naruto's second opponent had enough time to decide not to come into contact with Naruto's hand and leapt out of the way of Naruto's follow-up assault, but he soon found that he was being pressed, and before he could realize that Naruto was moving him with his actions, he was quite lucky to dodge a blade of wind that came from Naruto's feet, but he would not be lucky twice as he was caught by a flow up from Nar. Hanada's Byakugan was not activated. She could sense her opponents and knew exactly where their organs and vitals were, even down to the smallest details like pressure points, thanks to her training. So she didn't need her eyes to tell her that a fire jutsu was approaching her from the blind spot her fallen enemy had created with his body, because the next thing anyone saw was Hanada's form being consumed by fire. However, there was no scream, and the caster of the jutsu saw a log burn up in the flames. Before he could reconsider his options, a hand grabbed his ankle and dragged him down into the ground. However, 
The man soon turned to a log after Hanada emerged from the ground to finish the job. He approached her from behind, intending to end it with a quick jab of his sword at Hanada's unguarded back. However, he did not anticipate her taking a cross step with her right foot behind her left foot and ducking low, causing her to slip behind her opponent. She did this while performing a quick set of seals and holding onto the back of the ANBU's neck. Shudu Oberado Ninpo The Anbu then froze and slit his own throat with his sword. The terrified face of the root Anbu could have been seen if not for the mask, as he couldn't understand why his own body would not obey his commands. Hanada's technique was not one she learned from Master Kiyosh or from the scroll of Jutsu Naruto received from Master Kiyosh. Rather, it was a Jutsu of her own creation. Naruto had told her about the time he and Shizun, along with Tsunade and Jiraiya, fought Jiraiya and Kabuto. He told her about how Tsunade used some strange jutsu that confused Kaudo's nerves and caused other parts of his body to respond to signals intended for other limbs. She wondered if she could control a person's body and make it do what she wanted because of her knowledge of medicine and anatomy. It was intended to move people who had become unconscious for various reasons, but it turned out that a high level of concentration, precision, the ability to use Raiden, and intimate knowledge of the human nervous system were required, and would take even more if the person was still alive. All of this would be easy for her because she was Naruto's polar opposite in so many ways. She was grace and precision, while Naruto was speed and power. This isn't to say she wasn't quick and powerful, or that Naruto wasn't precise or graceful. Anyone who thought that would be dead. Naruto and Hanada examined the final Anbu after four of the five had died. Throughout the fight, he did not move to assist his comrades, instead standing and watching the action, but this did not bother Naruto. Tsubaki wasn't here, which worried him, and as if she heard him, he sensed two genin level chakra coming his way, and from the corner of his eye, he saw Tsubaki and her uncle kneeling to the side of him. Forgive us, Kanshisha sama, she began, we were betrayed by some of our own clansmen, and the rest were forced to exterminate them, but we suffered losses and many injuries. When Akahoshi heard this, he came to after witnessing Naruto and Hanada slaughtering eight Anbu in minutes. He was dizzy from the blood loss, but that didn't stop him from making fun of Naruto. Naruto spoke without taking his gaze away from the last Anbu. Sukihana-chan, make sure he lives, he said, motioning to Akahoshi, then go with Tsubaki's uncle to help as much of the Reizoku clan as possible and root out any other traitors from the rest of the village, but don't make too much noise. Kai is currently hunting down the traitors. Tsubaki made a suggestion before Hinata could leave. Kanshisha sama I believe it would be better if I also accompanied hanada sama to ensure her safety and to root those who we did not take care of earlier. Naruto and Hinata exchanged a glance before Naruto nodded and the three of them went to help the injured Reizoku clan members. As they walked away, Naruto noticed that his opponent had vanished. He searched his surroundings for him but couldn't find him. He didn't stay hidden for long, though, as a hand burst out of the ground and grabbed Naruto by the ankle. As the enemy emerged from the earth, Naruto quickly broke away from the contact and leapt several feet away. You are not as easy as the others because you can disappear from me so easily, Naruto praised in a tone that betrayed neither emotion nor thought, despite his smile. I might even say you're Donzo's roots best. The mask shinobi didn't seem surprised in the least. And I can see from your performance here tonight that you, Uzumaki-san, are quite smart and far removed from the boy Konoha once knew. Naruto gave a genuine smile in response to this statement. Now that you know Akahoshi had planned to betray me and who is supporting him, I'm hoping we can end this right here, what do you think? It doesn't matter. I've already won our battle. And what makes you think that? Before he could finish his question, he collapsed under his own weight and began clutching his ankle in pain. 
When he examined his ankle, he noticed that the skin had become infected. What have you done to me? Naruto inquired, surprised. This fight was over the moment I touched you, he said. I see, Naruto said before disabling himself with a puff of smoke. Cage Bunshin? He wondered. Just as he was about to say something, he heard Naruto's voice from all around him. Yurei Satsu no Jutsu, Fudan. Those words would have been the last thing he heard if it hadn't been for his keen sense of danger. He dove blindly to the side, feeling his arms cut and the Tsubaki tree topple over. He did not, however, have time to unwind. When he noticed his opponent in front of him performing a series of hand seals, he rushed to catch up with him, but he was too late to stop him as he abruptly finished. However, as the Anbu altered his course and sped up to launch whatever attack he had planned, he noticed that nothing had happened, only a tingling sensation that vanished as quickly as it had appeared. Quickly deciding that this was his opportunity to make contact with the flat-footed boy, he began his charge towards him, only to realize that his feet refused to obey his commands. But that wasn't all. He promptly collapsed on his face as the rest of his body lost all sensation and mobility. Raiden. Josho Mahi no Jutsu, Naruto's voice said, its effects are rather instantaneous, but not long-lasting. But it will last long enough for me to complete this task. Naruto went through another set of hand seals. Suchi Sokubaku no Jutsu, Doten. He couldn't move or feel the earth beneath him as it formed shackles of stone and mud around his ankles as he lay there on the ground. However, he could feel the burning sensation of the bones in his wrists and ankles a few seconds later. He let out an involuntary scream as a result of the suddenness. Now that I know you're not mute, Naruto said coldly, we can talk. I'm not going to say anything. That's fine, if I wanted that, we wouldn't be having this conversation here, Naruto said as he broke off a branch from the toppled tree. I happen to have prior knowledge of Akahoshi's scheme for quite some time now, and I am also aware of who and what you are, as well as who is your leader, and as a result I have no doubt he will attempt to have me removed should he learn of that. How come you're telling me this? After all, Naruto had just revealed to one of Donzo's own subordinates that he had discovered Donzo's dirty secret. Even a captured ninja posed a threat, comparable to a dying tiger. When a ninja was dead, they were completely harmless. Because you root will no longer be free to do as you wish tonight, Naruto explained, which brings me to a question that. More of a choice really. Under any circumstances, I will not give you anything. My question is, who are you loyal to, Danzo or Konoha? Naruto began. I am loyal to Konoha because I serve Danzo. Naruto sighed and slammed the branch against the ninja's back, knocking him unconscious. Incorrect response. Naruto used this to create a shadow clone that bound the root agent and followed Naruto to the Reizoku clan compounds. Meanwhile, Hanada. Naruto's house and the Reizoku clan's house were not far apart. In fact, they were next door neighbors. The Reizoku clan, on the other hand, was a secretive and quiet bunch, and after a long history of living in the shadows, living apart from everyone else became the traditional normal thing to do. Despite this, it was not a long walk for a regular citizen. Hanada dashed through shrubs and trees to help the Reizoku clan members when she abruptly stopped and kicked Tsubaki, who was trailing behind her, in the stomach, sending her crashing into a tree. Tsubaki's uncle, Reizoku Kiro, withdrew a kanai as she did this. Forgive me, Hanada-sama, he yelled as he lunged at her, the weapon piercing her heart. When Hanada heard Kiro's words, her leg was still in the air from her assault on Tsubaki. When the blade was only a few inches away from her heart, she leaned back and performed a small but graceful back flip, taking full advantage of her flexibility. As a result, her other foot rose off the ground and collided with his chin. 
The blow itself was not particularly hard, and because it was slow, Kiro was able to avoid the brunt of the attack. However, the kick was a Juken kick, and his world exploded in pain as a result. Hanada finished her flip as Kiro clutched his jaw, and in the blink of an eye, she was back on him, this time giving him a soft tap on the stomach, forcing him to double over and empty the contents of his stomach. Tsubaki took advantage of the situation by sneaking up behind Hanada and raising her ninja to stab Hanada in the back. Hanada quickly turned around and clamped her hands around Tsubaki's neck, causing her to choke and drop her blade, and her eyes widened when she saw Hanada's fierce Byakugan eyes staring at her, as if watching into her very soul. Who are you, and where has she gone? She inquired. How did you find out? Tsubaki, inquired. You made two mistakes, Hanada said as her other hand glowed green. First, Tsubaki or any member of the Reizoku clan rarely refers to Naruto as Kanshisha-sama, preferring to refer to him as Uzumaki-sama. And secondly, Hanada said as she tapped her wrists and legs, severing the tendons, ligaments, and muscles before dropping her on the ground, Tsubaki will never suggest leaving Naruto's side for reasons that Kiro-san over there should have known. As she said this, she turned away from the now paralyzed, Tsubaki, and looked at Kiro, who was lying on the ground. Even though his retching had stopped, he was still clutching his stomach. His gall bladder was ruptured by the final strike to his stomach. He will not die immediately as a result of it. However, he was still dying as bile leaked into and poisoned his organs. It was a long and painful death, but one Hanada could have avoided if she had wished. I guess we're at a standstill here, Tsubaki said, because I can't harm you in this body because you've disabled it, and you can't kill me because the only way to do so is to kill this body, and you're not the type to kill your loyal subordinates because you didn't kill him, and you need to tend to the Reizoku clan members. Hanada paused, her Byakugan still activated, and after a few seconds smiled, sending chills down, Tsubaki's spine. My eyes have improved over the years, so I don't need them much when I fight, but now that they're activated, I can clearly see that even though they're wounded, they don't need any assistance," Hanada said, tilting her head in a playful manner as she pointed in a specific direction, and isn't that your body hidden over there? The lack of expression or response was all she needed. Hanada performed a couple of quick hand seals. Tsubaki's body went limp as she saw this, but Hanada had already launched her jutsu. Mizudan Ansatsu no Jutsu, Sweden. The small orb of liquid screeched from her mouth towards the slumped over root ANBU's head. The Shintenshin no Jutsu could only be defeated in two ways. Either completely avoided because it was a slow Jutsu, or have someone kill the caster, who is vulnerable after the Jutsu is successful. This was the flaw in that Jutsu and the Anbu was well aware of it, so he released the technique and attempted to return to his body as soon as possible, but it was not to be. He didn't have a chance to move as he returned to his body and opened his eyes before a small orb of water slammed through his skull, killing him instantly. So that's it for today, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you, see you all in my next video.